Welcome to another TOEFL listening practice video. In this video, we will listen to a lecture, answer some questions about it, review the correct answers and explanations. Don't forget to subscribe for more TOEFL listening practice. We're going to delve into an important topic in psychology, human memory and cognitive processes. Understanding how memory works is essential not only in psychology, but also in education, neuroscience, and even artificial intelligence. We'll cover the main types of memory, key theories, and how cognitive processes influence our ability to store and retrieve information. Let's start with the basic structure of memory. Most psychologists divide memory into three main types. Sensory memory, short-term memory, and long-term memory. Sensory memory is the briefest and captures information from our senses, sights, sounds, smells, but only holds it for a fraction of a second. For example, when you see an image, the visual information is temporarily stored in your sensory memory, but it fades almost instantly if you don't pay attention to it. Now, if we focus on the sensory information, it moves into what we call short-term memory, sometimes also called working memory. Short-term memory is where we actively process information. For instance, when you try to remember a phone number just long enough to dial it, that's short-term memory at work. However, this type of memory has a limited capacity. Most people can hold about seven pieces of information, give or take two, for around 20 to 30 seconds. So, how does information move in a long-term memory? The transition from short-term to long-term memory often involves rehearsal or repetition. If you keep repeating that phone number, for instance, it might eventually make its way into your long-term memory. Long-term memory can store vast amounts of information for a lifetime. It's how we remember events from childhood, facts we've learned in school, or even the skills we've developed over the years. A key model that helps explain this process is the multi-store model of memory, proposed by Atkinson and Schifrin in 1968. According to this model, memory works like a flow, passing information from sensory memory to short-term memory and eventually into long-term memory if the right conditions are met. This model laid the foundation for much of what we know about memory today. However, researchers have found that this model is somewhat limited. A more recent theory that builds upon it is the concept of working memory, introduced by Alan Baddeley and Graham Hitch in 1974. Working memory emphasizes not just storing information temporarily, but actively manipulating it. Let's say you're trying to solve a math problem in your head. You're holding numbers in your short-term memory, but you're also performing calculations, organizing information, and maybe even comparing it to past knowledge. That's working memory in action. It's more dynamic and complex than just holding data. Now, let's move on to how memories are retrieved. A key theory here is the encoding specificity principle introduced by Endel Tulving. This principle suggests that memories are more easily retrieved when the context during retrieval is similar to the context during encoding or when the memory was originally formed. For example, if you study for an exam in a quiet room, you're more likely to recall that information well if you take the test in a similarly quiet environment. This principle explains why certain smells or sounds can trigger vivid memories. They bring us back to the context in which the memory was formed. Another fascinating aspect of memory is how it can be shaped by cognitive processes like attention. Attention is crucial to memory formation. When you're distracted while trying to learn something, say you're studying with the TV on or checking your phone, it's likely that you won't remember the material as well. Research has shown that divided attention during learning decreases the likelihood of that information making it into long-term memory. This is why multitasking can be harmful when trying to focus on important tasks. To add another layer, the role of emotion in memory is also worth mentioning. Studies have shown that emotionally charged events are often remembered more vividly and for longer periods of time. This is due to the involvement of the amygdala, a part of the brain that processes emotions and can enhance the encoding of memories. For example, 
Most people can remember exactly where they were and what they were doing during significant emotional events, like major natural disasters or personal milestones, even years later. To summarize, memory is a highly complex process that involves several stages. Sensory memory, short-term or working memory, and long-term memory. Key theories like the multi-store model and working memory provide frameworks for understanding how we process, store, and retrieve information. In addition, cognitive processes such as attention, context, and emotion play critical roles in shaping our memories. Understanding these mechanisms has important implications for education, therapy, and even artificial intelligence. One, what is the primary focus of the lecture? Two, According to the professor, which of the following best describes the capacity of short-term memory? Three, based on the lecture, how does the working memory theory differ from the multi-store model of memory? Four, why does the professor mention the example of doing a math problem in your head? Five, what can be inferred about the encoding specificity principle from the professor's explanation? Six, why does the professor mention the role of emotion in memory at the end of the lecture? 